Uh, a good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being patient as we get started here. Um, appreciate you joining us for this session. I'm really, really excited to have Dr. Fon and Christina from uh, University of Pennsylvania um, School of Engineering and Applied Science here. We're really excited to talk to you about data science. I know a lot of you have questions about how to get in and what to apply and what's going on in the world of data science. So. Uh, we do have a few slides we'll share in a second here, but before we do that, Dr. Fon, could you please introduce yourself and tell our audience and students from across, mostly India right now, uh, who you are and how you got into data science and what do you do currently, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you, uh, Girish. Um, so it's really my great pleasure to be here today uh, to discuss with you about data science. Um, so, uh, as you may know, my name is Lin Fang. I'm an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and I'm also the co-director of the um, data science master programs that we have at Penn. Um, and uh, so, um, in my work, I, I, I work in the area of, um, uh, you know, large-scale distributed system and cyber physical systems uh, and in this system you can see there's a lot of applications of data science to make this system much more reliable safer and you know better um, and so uh, i've been with the program for some times um you know um guiding students and and you know uh, help uh, shaping the you know future generation of the data scientists and um um you know i hope that maybe one day i see you here at Penn. all right <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. Christina, could you briefly introduce yourself as well? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Welcome, everyone. My name is Christina Burton. I'm Associate Director of Graduate Admissions Operations at Penn Engineering. I look forward to answering your questions about admissions, about our deadlines, and some tips that we have to help you stand out as applicants. Thank you for being here. Perfect. Thank you, Christina. So a couple of things, housekeeping, please put your questions in the Q&A tab. We'll have a first few minutes where Dr. Fon's going to talk about trends and opportunities in data science in 21 and beyond. And then I'm going to have Christina share a little bit about applications and tips and et cetera that you want to know. And then we'll get into the Q&A. We'll stick around for about an hour or so to answer any of the questions you have. So with that said, I am going to put the screen up here. Um, so, Dr. Fan, all yours. Thank you. Um, so, hello, everyone. Um, uh, so, today um, I'm going to, just in this uh, talk, I'm going to just talk a little bit about, you know, uh, data science, uh, in particular, how we get where we are, and, and if we look into the future, what's there for us, right? And so, uh, hopefully, uh, through this talk, you'll be inspired to get into the field, you, if you are not already in the field yourselves. Um, and so, uh, next question. So the first question one may ask is, so why data science? So why is this such, um, uh, you know, a buzzword these days? Um, it keeps like next, yeah, next. And uh, you probably have seen a lot of news about data science these days um, that, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, all the things, all the best terms that you could imagine. Uh, for example, uh, it is like the sexiest jobs of the 21st century. Um, you see a great demand in the data science job in 2021. So you, we are in the middle of the pandemic and you can see that even uh, through all the difficulty that we are facing right now, uh, data science still keeps growing. Right? Uh, and uh, there's uh, data science also seen as the career that is going to shape our future to come. Uh, it's the one of the best job. So there's a lot of things that you can hear about data science, and it's all good thing. Employment is exploring. There's great demands. Um, this is not just in the context of um, the agreement or in uh, I'm sorry in industry, but you also see that there's also blooming in terms of research. Uh, in particular, actually, just two days ago, the National Science Foundation in the U.S. just announced that they are going to fund 75 millions to uh, uh, five data say, uh, science uh, research institutes. Right? And so, this is an important and challenging problem that we are looking into here. Um, and so, uh, next question. And so why, where do we arrive at today with data science today? And I will think that data science is a convolution of many emerging trends that we've seen in the past, you know, decade or so. 
Uh, and first and foremost, that's the data era that we are living in today. Next. Uh, so you see that across all the areas from social science to um, uh, medicine to physics, uh, natural science, uh, uh, business, public policies and so on, you see there's a huge amount of data that is being generated, being contributed and shared, distributed every day. So we are really seeing data everywhere. For instance, in the context of ge genomics, and you, do you know that it actually takes a lot of uh, storage to just store one human genome. And in fact, it is predicted that you are going to, to need a lot of storage in order to store all the, the uh, genomic data of a human being in the next few years. Uh, and likewise, you also see that experiments are being done at a large scale in the context of physics, for instance. Right. Next. Next. But that's not all right. You also see that uh, through every day you're interacting with the social networks like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, uh, Google, all, all these actually, you see that data actually keep being generated by user into various different media, different shapes, different forms. Um, and lately, there's also an immersion of a new technology called the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things in this uh, new paradigm here, we see sensors and actuators all over uh, you know, the world, but each of us already having a lot of sensors. We have our own camera, which is a type of sensor that can take a lot of information and data from the environment. And so with this, we see data have been, uh, uh, you know, basically they are of all over the world now. And with this amount of data that we have, there's raising question of how are we going to get the knowledge and utilize the data to uh, learn something useful, to make decisions, make predictions so that we can guide our business decisions or study about uh, human behavior, study about uh, maybe a certain type of disease, uh, maybe climate change. So, so all the field come together to utilize this data to to make better decision and to advance the science, advance the impact in, in the society. Next. Right. So that, that is only one, uh, one of the uh, technology that uh, drive data science. But data science is also driven by another driving force, which is the innovation that you've seen nowadays in, in hardware and in software algorithms. Right. Next. And so on the one hand, you see that storage are uh, becoming much cheaper nowadays. You can buy a lot of storage with uh, very uh, a little amount of money. So there's no longer uh, a challenge in having enough storage to store this data. And the software also enables this storage to make access to this uh, access to data a lot faster. Next. Beyond that, you also see computing power is growing exponentially. So you have machine servers are extremely powerful with hundreds of cores, and that can perform computation very uh, quickly. Uh, there's also many different kinds of hardware, for example, FPGA, you see GBUs, and also of heterogeneous hardware that are now being produced and being used uh, to process this amount of data that we acquire in real time. Right. Next. Uh, on top of that, you also see, uh, unlike before, we are no longer limited to the uh, platform on which we can execute or can analyze the data. Right now, most people are now have access to the cloud, and then the internet access like five G technology has already becoming uh, uh, ubiquitous in many places. And so, with this cloud environment that also emerging you can now perform all the computation in environment with much cheaper price and you can do a lot of jobs you know which is much unlike what you've done maybe several decades ago right and next and then of course like with the internet of things you see there's a lot of uh, smart sensors or smart devices that we see all day and these sensors and devices like help us sense the environment so we we collect the data and then we also actuate back to the environment through these devices, for example, medical devices with based on you know data that you send from a, a patient, and then you perform data analysis and then you make decision, then you uh, actuate it, you know, uh, interact with the patient to have the patient feel better. And so that's next. That's where 
because of this driving force, you see the arrival of data science, right? So in a way, it's like a new discipline that is built on top of many, many disciplines that we are already familiar with, coming from computer science, engineering, or mathematics, or statistics, and many more. And one very unique characteristic of data science is the fact that it also drive a lot of knowledge from the uh, specific domains. For example, when you solve a data science problem, it really matters which exact application domain you, you focus on, whether it's for healthcare or for, for doing public policy or solving uh, the climate problem, business and so on. And so therefore, you can also see that data science really leverage the knowledge and the techniques and tools that have been developed in not just the core area like computer science, engineering, math and so on, but also a range of other applications from business finance to bioinformatics and natural science and so on. Right? So it is truly very interdisciplinary. And so what is the question we want to answer in computer science? So data science is really, uh, really about uh, making use of the data. So based on the data, can we extract the information, useful information, useful knowledge from the data, and then make predictions based on this data, right? And this is a very different uh, paradigm compared to a lot of the other sciences that you've seen before. For example, in, in physics, like typically you have well-defined models like the law of gravity, uh, or in, in engineering, the uh, models for the physical processes and so on. And so based on those, you can do simulation to you know do prediction and do analysis. In contrast, in the data science, right, data is the first class uh, uh, citizens. So it's a data oriented approach. So here you don't have already the well defined model, but you are going to learn from the data. So make use of data to learn this model so that we can make predictions and make decisions uh, for the specific problem we want to solve. Uh, so this is a very contrast um, shift from what we have been uh, familiar with. And that's also why you can see that it is really the convolution of many different areas that bring together uh, to make it really work. Okay. Next. Right, so in data, the data science process go through multiple states, as you can see in the picture here, it go from how do you capture data, like acquire data, uh, to uh, how do you maintain the data, to create insights to data, uh, how do you mine the data, you know, like, how, what kind of model we use to model this data uh, to the analysis part where we apply different machine learning algorithms to, um, to you know, analyze data uh, to come up with some kind of quantitative uh, uh, properties. Uh, and then last but not least, that's how do we communicate, right? Uh, what you have, you have to think about, uh, can I visualize in certain way? How do we make the decision for the specific problem we look on, right? And so the data science process go through many different stages, right? Now, the key thing is that you can see that in many different areas, people actually are doing a lot of the same thing. So they, they have different data sets and they do uh, pretty much similar things on these different data sets, right? And you could imagine that there's a lot of reputation in how this is done, right? And so the science of data science is really data and science. We want to build not just specific solutions, but also build common the infrastructures that enable you to solve this question and that can be applied to a broad range of application domains, right? And the very question to come with that uh, more generic and more um, um, uh, fundamental uh, understanding and technology for data science is uh, to be able to answer several questions. For example, how do we enable reuse of data, right? Digital data, the schema, the way that we do data wrangling, whether we, how do we integrate the data, the reuse of algorithms that we have for the analysis uh, or work go about doing this not just in one particular place, but across different organizations, across different application domains. The next question, we also want to learn and want to uh, develop techniques that help us understand data better, right? Where do the data come from? Uh, do these data actually compare, become uh, uh, suitable for our assumptions, right? Uh, how do we actually 
change the data product as you know when the input changes how do we how does that change affect the whole process right? uh, and then last but not least uh, we also need to think about you know try not to be the data parasites and so we want to be able to also recognize reward user for uh, you know creating this data editing code because a lot of effort that go into it right? and so you can see next data science is really a domains that require the knowledge from many different other domains right and so inherently it is interdisciplinary and uh, with that you can see that most of the time you look into data science it's not just one particular area but actually people are working on it and whether they come from business or from medicine from natural science or from physics and then all these people come together to come up with the solution or design this methodology for the, the data science right? and so in a way uh data science is still a new field right and more importantly it is constantly evolving uh, so we know quite a bit now um but there's a lot more that we don't know yet and there's a lot more, many more challenges that we will have to address as we move forward to make data science uh, a mature field and to make it a field that we can use to make real impact in the society. And so next I'm going to um, share with you some of the fundamental uh, questions or challenges that uh, uh, we are trying to address in the field of data science. Right? Uh, and these are done by today in many research institutions, but also in industries. And these are the problems that we have to, to address. Right? And of course, there's just a few of them. Uh, there's a lot more. Yeah. So the first thing that you could imagine is the how do we actually handle the data heterogeneity? Right? As I mentioned earlier, data comes from many different sources. You could It could be generated by, by a Twitter. It could come from maybe a, a scanning of digital documents. It could come from patient, uh, uh, you know, monitoring data like the, the, the heart rate and so on, right? And so there are many different data sources and data comes in many shapes and forms. They vary in terms of volumes, in terms of variety, in terms of velocities, like if, whether the data come in a streaming fashion or something like more, uh, more static in a batch fashion, in terms of of uh, accuracy, uh, the uncertainty. All right, next. And because of that, one of the fundamental questions that many researchers are looking at is that how do we handle this heterogeneity? How do we standardize data types and formats for representing these types of data, regardless of where they come from, and sometimes even if they come from seemingly uh, unrelated data sources? All right, next. Uh, but more than that, uh, what you want from this is also that from all this, suppose you already have a standardized data type and format, the way to represent this data. How are we going about to be a model, uh, an accurate model uh, from this data source, right? A model that can help us predict, help us infer the knowledge, right? So this is, again, another challenge question. And sometimes you don't just have one model, right? And very often it's useful to look into a set of models that, you know, a meta model that capture the strengths of, of uh, you know, um, the, the differences in the data. And then you could imagine that there are a lot of trade offs that one we have to design um, uh, because there's sometimes you could have a model that can run very, that give very accurate results, but it could take forever to run, right? So there's this um, trade off between the statistical aspect and the computational aspect that you need to take into place in order to define what does it mean by an optimal value, an uh, uh, optimal model. So this is one, one issue that is currently being addressed. Next. The next one is again, the also because of the characteristic of the data that we have here. So the world is messy. And so the real, real world data are inherently messy, right? And a lot of time you have data set and there are many data points that, that don't have all the complete information. They have a lot of noise. And in that case, we need to be able to build techniques, data science techniques that can reason, that can infer and can predict even if these data are noisy, even if there's not enough information. Right? And so actually being able to reason in the uh, presence of noisy data or in the absence of complete data is a 
extremely challenging, right? And we want to be able to do it accurately. We want to do it efficiently, uh, and we want to be it, uh, in a reliable fashion as well. Right? And so this is another question, uh, questions, a fundamental question that is uh, that we, we need to address next. And now, um, uh, have you ever seen a self-driving cars? Or you, <laughs> you know, um, data science has made a step towards a much more, you know, safety critical systems. And and this actually the field of my 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 own field of research. Uh, so I can talk a lot about this. So that's obviously we don't have time. And so you can see nowadays there's a lot of AI we call AI enabled system as uh, that are cyber physical systems, which are systems that contribute con consists of not just the cyber component but also the physical components so system that interact with the real world for example autonomous driving um medical devices uh smart grid and uh, you know airplanes and all these are uh, the types of a uh, system that interact with the real world and interact with human right and so one of the property that we want the system to have is that they need to be safe they need to be reliable and they have to be such designed such that we can trust our life upon this right imagine you are in a self-driving car if you don't know whether it's safe or not uh, you probably need to think twice before you step into that car right and so these are properties that we want not just to to optimize but also to guarantee in many many uh ways right next and so with this, uh, there's been substantial, a lot of research recently in, in different fields that look into uh, trustworthy AI. Uh, in particular, the question that we want to address here is that how do we develop techniques, modern techniques, uh, you know, analysis methods, uh, system building uh, uh, methodology, and so on, in a way that we can guarantee the systems always behaving correctly, is always safe, it's reliable and uh, is secure from any potential adversarial attack. And so these are fundamental questions, fundamental questions that are extremely challenging to address, um, uh, that come from, you know, to, to address this, there's a lot of things that need to be done. For example, how do we build a trustworthy model? And why is it so hard when we want to prove this property for AI-enabled components? And the fact is that a lot of the analysis comes from the data, it's based on data. So the guarantee that you have in analysis can only be as good as the guarantee of the day, you know, the certainty of data itself. But data that we have is, is oftentimes they are unknown or they are uncertain, right? And just so you can see that any kind of behavior is it make it it's a lot harder for us to do any kind of guarantees. Um and so um, we actually recently there's been quite a bit of research, uh, including like people from formal methods community think about way to formalize it so that we can actually have a formal proof of the property that we want. Uh, obviously, a lot of trade off we have to be uh, to be made because we can't have the kind of worst case guarantee that we used to have in the past where it's not really dependent on data. Next. Uh, so the next area is where I would say AI meets system, all right? All right. And uh, if you recall, I mentioned earlier, there's an, a proliferation of new hardware technology, you know, a powerful machine, new storage, different types of hardware, GBUs, and so on. That in itself is extremely useful for enabling us to do data analytics a lot faster, a lot more efficient, right? But there's a bird there, right? If you look into the demands of the amount of compute that you need for AI uh, tasks, so for example, you look at like uh, the, the, the the going from like the game like the AlphaGo Zero, right? You go from Alex next to AlphaGo Zero, it's a 3,000 times increase in computation demands, right? And so this exponential increase in computation demand for AI training, AI prediction, it's going to outpace the progress that we actually are making for the, in on the hardware side, right? And so with that, uh, next, yeah. right. there comes the questions of how do we still meet this demand in terms of computation or stories of computation that AI tasks require uh, through better software design, through better computer system, right? And that is not just on the software layer, but also in hardware layer. So the 
the shift here from the traditional design methodology is that we're well, not design computer system just for, for compute uh, heavy client application. Here, we need to think of a new way of designing such the system such that data is being the first class citizen. So you need to base on data and design the system around this, the way that we use data, the way that assess, we assess data, the way that we, um, uh, uh, you know, we uh, introduce new data in the system, right? And that means that uh, a lot of uh, uh, new developments will have to be done for uh, how to do, um, how do we process this homogeneous data in an efficient manner? How do we lay out the data in the in the hardware in such a way that we can assess it faster? How do we design the communication between different components, different subsystems? Uh, because oftentimes data science is done in a distributed fashion, right? in such a way that we don't have much latency. But more than that, we also need to think about the question of energy, the impact that it has on today's climate, right? And so these are the clear question that a system designer will have to think about and, and design the system to, to meet this uh, demand, right? Uh, next. But it's not just about design system for AI. The reverse also is true, right? Can we take advantage of AI or data science to do better, uh, to build better system? Right? For example, can I use a uh, um, data science technique to enable me to predict, say, adversarial attack, so that I can build my system much more resilient to any future attack to come? Right. And so this is really not really two separate fields, but it's really to me, it's really a core design of, of data science and system. They come hand in hand and they tie, they are tying to each other to make as a whole, you know, the, the entire, uh, a, a better outcome on both sides. Thanks. And I will end all the challenges with uh, one last um, uh, challenges, uh, one challenge in data science and that's privacy, right? And so, as you see, data is being generated uh, every day. In fact, if you go to Google, every time you go and search, some data is captured about you know your search patterns and so on. You go to Amazon. In fact, Amazon has the entire history of everything that I ever bought, right? <laughs> that enables them to do you know target advertising and so on. So that's great. It is help uh, you know advanced you know business and 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 maybe sometimes it might help me too. But at the same time, how would I be sure that you know some of these data that they capture doesn't ever compromise my confidentiality, right? Uh, a lot of the data are, you know, sensitive information, right? How do I make sure that these companies are not going to release it, share it in, in you know, in other way? How, how do I make sure they misuse this private information that I have, right? And so there's a, a lot of rising concerns about privacy in the age of data science. And as a result of that, you also see now the emergence of many privacy laws around the world, you know, law that law and regulation that, that um, involves how one can use data, uh, not just about data, but also about the algorithm itself. Right? And so what does it mean for us? Right, in the data science perspective, we need to be able to design data analytics in such a way that it can preserve privacy of the data set and of the user, right? And that is obviously a question, but um, lately there's been a number of advances that boost this direction forwards. For example, the uh, differential privacy, the different te encryption techniques or secure multi-party computation and so on. So all these techniques are being developed across many different domains in system, in, in um, machine learning community, in security community, uh, uh, and that's been applied in many other like specific application domain too. Right? And so privacy is a big concern and there's many unsolved questions to address here. Right? Next. Uh, and so uh, that, but then there's a lot of other, uh, other challenging questions, other opportunities for, for new research innovation, for new studies and, you know, uh, new exploration uh, as we move forward in data science, uh, with whether how do we actually understand, like say, understand deep learning uh, uh, better, 
why it does the way it does, right? Why it works, right? How do we deal with fairness in data science? How about the ethical concerns about data science? So there's a, a whole range of problems that we data scientists and data science researcher um, and many of us we have to come together, you know, to address this. Okay, next. And with that, so you can see that at Penn, uh, uh, we have also a, a, a lot of research going on to address some of these challenges that I um, mentioned earlier. We have different institutes uh, from different schools, like the Warren uh, Center for Network Data Science uh, in, in Engineering. We have the Institute for Bioinformatics. We have the Warren Budget Model uh, at Penn. Uh, and, uh, the precise center which deal with um, like safety critical systems. No? So there's a lot of research and it's a very active research uh, environment at Penn that is working, you know, many people are working on data science basically. Right. Next. All right, so you may wonder, so what does it look like? So now we are in 2021 and earlier in my very first slide, you see that there are a lot of talk about data science, right? But if we look forward, where how does it look like? Right? And uh, it turns out that if you think, if I have one word to sum up, then I will say that data science is a job, not just of today, but also of the future, right? And so there's a growing exponentially demands for data scientists across the board, right? Uh, you see that uh, that's driven by the fact that also there's a lot more data that you generate every year. Uh, the market size going to increase to, for example, like it's predicted that uh, worldwide market size going to be like over 200 billion by 2025, uh, uh, right? Uh, there's a lot more jobs, for example, in the US alone, we'll be, we are going to see about like more than 11.5 million new jobs are going to added in data science, right? And so overall, this is an exciting field. It has uh, a uh, uh, you know, a lot of demands for data scientists, um, while still quite relatively uh, fewer, you know, not as much supply. So the, the rate of demands much higher than the rate of supply, right? And so this is really an area that, uh, you know, um, students, you know, should get into, all right? Next, right? And so um, for that very reason, right? because of these huge demands and because of the, the lack of, of the supply of data scientists that we need to solve this important problem to make you impact in the world. Uh, there's a lot of focus on, you know, besides research, besides industry, there's also focus on education. And you see uh, several programs that have been established to train the next generation data scientists. And that actually is like what, what we have here at Penn's, you know, the uh, master in data science is a product of, uh, you know, a collaboration from many different schools within the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's an, uh, an interdisciplinary program that, you know, draw the curriculum from different courses that, uh, you know, offer across many different departments, right? And the program has been very successful. So we started in 2018 and now it's, uh, we have like currently like over 240 students currently. And we see every year we see like about like 2000 applications every year, right? And so you can see that uh, with this, um, you know, there's a, a need for new data scientists, but there's also a need for how to better educate students to be the next generation data scientists. Next. Okay. And so let me briefly introduce you a little bit of some of our program to, to have a feel of what does it require, what does it need to be successful to be a, a data scientist. Right? So here at Penn, we build our curriculum based on the core, the foundation, and the technical and depth. Right? And I'll go next. Our goal here is not just, you know, one particular area. What we want is that we want to train students to have in-depth understanding of the foundational data science, like whether it's models and methods or a system or to all these technology and techniques that we need for data science, right? So that's the foundation. Uh, so that's the deep, the depth. We also want to have a broad. So after you know, when you go through a, a program like this, you will have a broad knowledge of many different potential application domains, and you know how to take 
the knowledge that you learn in the foundation to bring it to the next level, right? To apply to a specific setting to solve the particular question that you are interested in, right? And so in training data scientists, we want to make you know the data the student to become ready for any areas of data scientific careers, right? Whether you want to go to technology or engineering, whether consulting or policy making. Or maybe just to understand, like if you're interested in, they say, arts or literature or just for communication. So these are, are, are the goals that we we write here. And uh, here you can see as example of the curriculum here, you can see that, that the foundation, the core, where you look, look into different techniques, the algorithm for solving this problem. Uh, but at the very top here, that's the, the most exciting thing part where you see that you, you can do thesis on a particular application domains, and you can see there's a lot of different domains from biomedicine to, um, to survey statistics to, to like social network, uh, uh, and so on. Right? And so that all together, that brings us the, the, the breadth and the depth that uh, any student would need to, you know, to be someone, to be a data scientist uh, of the future. Okay, next. All right. And so uh, you may wonder, you know, uh, suppose you go through a, a master program in data science, so that's how great I go to. So what, what's next after that, right? And you already know that there's a great demand from across all industry for, for data scientists, right? Uh, and that's also, this slide also aim to show you this another evidence of the success of the programs and the, the uh, success that you will get when you actually go through a pro like to have gone through the training to become a data scientist right uh, through here you see all the you know well-known name from google to facebook microsoft uh, uh, company like finance and, and very different areas here right uh, and so with that i like to next try to end our um uh, my my talk here with a couple of, of key tech home uh, messages uh, so data science is uh, a constantly evolving field, in exciting field, uh, but constantly evolving field. So that's what makes it most exciting about this, right? Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, we know a lot already, but there's also a lot of uh, challenging questions, a lot of, uh, you know, fundamental challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, and so that is an ample opportunity for, for all of you to go in, you know, uh, use your brain and your selfish different questions to make impact. Right, uh, and and uh, uh, no time like the present. This is really an exciting time to actually get involved. And, and with that, I end here. Next, uh, you know, and next, Krishna. So why not start with ten? All right, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You answered so much in such a short time. I know this is a topic that we could talk for probably two hours and not get all the questions answered. And there are a ton of questions coming in, many of whom you touched upon. But before we get into some of the big questions that I wanted to highlight, I want to have Christina answer a couple of the questions that have, you know, that people are upvoting a little bit. And that has to do with admissions and financial yes. aid and scholarships and timelines. So Christina, would you like to share your screen so we can get that going first? And once we're done with that, when we have a little bit of time left, we'll address a couple of big topics like privacy and ethics in uh, data science. So let me share your screen here. Thank you for that excellent presentation, uh, Professor Fan. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a little information. This is a timeline for what you should expect to be completing during your senior year of undergraduate studies if you want to enter a graduate program. So beginning in August, now I, I will preface this with I know um, based on your attendance here, I gather that most of you are people who have prepared far ahead. You've had um, wonderful experiences and have networked in ways that set you up to be successful during the graduate admissions process. So good for you. Um, but here's what you should be thinking to accomplish in your senior year. So August has already passed us, September has already passed us, but in that time, um, it's expected you would have prepared for your standardized exams specifically for the GRE. Um, I will note that for Penn Engineering, for the second admission season in a row, we are making the GREs optional. Um, but I know other schools you might be considering will require those scores. So hopefully in August of, and September of this year, you began planning for, to take the GRE exam, you registered, you um, developed a plan for studying, and everything is on track for you. 
Um, in terms of in September, we also hope that you would have consulted with your advisor, your academic advisor, as well as career services, so that they can help you to um, finalize your documents for um, admissions requirements. I didn't go over this previously, but as you know, our application requirements are standard. So um, we require two letters of recommendation. We will accept up to three. Uh, so it's important that during this time, if you haven't already, that you reach out to faculty or perhaps someone who led an internship opportunity for you to write a letter on your behalf. Now in the month of October, it's expected that you'll take the GRE if you're applying to schools that require it. And also um, for people who are on, in the US or permanent residents to fill out the FAFSA so that you can be considered for funding opportunities. So now looking forward to November. Um, so you would have submitted your graduate application or, or started to submit them. I will say for Penn Engineering, the Data Science Master's Program has two application deadlines. The early decision deadline is November 1st, and the final decision deadline is February 1st. All right, so you will start or and or submit your applications during the coming month um, and ensure that your schools have received your GRE scores if they are required. In December, I strongly encourage our applicants to pay attention to admissions emails as well as checklists. A lot of times we and other schools will not evaluate your application until it is finalized. So you want to make sure that all the required documents have been submitted and are legible and are ready to be reviewed. Uh, in the months of January through March, we really ask people to focus in on searching for scholarships and grants to fund your graduate experience. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as at most other schools, master's students are respected, uh, expected to um, be responsible for their funding. So it is expected that you will search for scholarships and grants that will supplement the cost of tuition and living expenses. From March through June, you should get some application decisions flooding in. For those of you who intend to apply to Penn Engineering, if you submit your application by the early decision deadline of November 1st, you can generally expect to receive a decision in January. If you submit your application by the regular deadline, which is February 1, you can expect to receive a decision in April. So I like to tell people, look at the schools that you are considering and consider applying by the early decision deadline for two reasons. One, you will remove some stress of, and anxiety about waiting to receive your decision, especially if you are outside of the United States and need to go through the process of obtaining a visa. It's better to know earlier which schools have accepted you and to make a decision about which one you'll attend. And then um, secondly, if you apply early, of course, um, you know, that demonstrates something to people who are reviewing your application. That demonstrates to us that we are perhaps among your first choice or your first choice. And so um, op when opportunities arise for funding, you will be considered for that purpose. So I hope that this information is helpful. I just have a few more tips before I close out. So before applying, I always encourage people to be intentional about who you're asking to be a recommender. It is really great um, it sounds great to say that I have the chair, the chair of my academic department writing a letter of recommendation on my behalf, and that would be great. However, it's more important that you get a faculty member who can speak to the work you've done related to your academic field, whether that's in a research laboratory, whether that's um, an internship experience you've take on, taken on, or maybe you acted as a teaching assistant. So consider carefully who you ask to be your recommender. Start investing in some extracurricular activities. So I'm sure most of you have already done so, but maybe take on an internship if you're somebody who's not in your senior year. Um, maybe participate in summer research opportunities. Things that will highlight for the um, application reviewers that you are passionate about this specific field and that you have been proactive in seeking out opportunities that would give you more information, more experience, and make you distinguished as an applicant. I would say thoroughly review research programs to determine your best fit. Uh, so if you're someone who knows you wanna pursue a master's opportunity, but you'd like to focus um, some of your um, time on research, see if there's opportunity for you to um, participate in a master's thesis in your program. That is available at Penn Engineering for those who wanna pursue more research. So 
review thoroughly, maybe reach out to some different laboratories that you're considering at your different engineering schools. Um, I would say reach out to faculty, absolutely. Um, maybe they can give you some guidance about based on your interests, what programs are best fit for you, and then start up looking into prestigious fellowships. I will say that applicants who apply to our programs who have been um, recipients of prestigious fellowships, that does signal something to us. That signals that you're proactive. That signals that you've put in time to make yourself a distinguished applicant so that you can receive that fellowship. And while you're applying, it is really critical to make sure you have people proofreading your application materials. So I'd say get one or two people who you trust um, to read through your application materials and make sure there aren't any errors. Maybe they can give you advice on perhaps strengthening your personal statement, which is a very critical part of your application. That's the only part of your application where you get to create the narrative as to why you're interested in this field, how you became interested, and what you expect to be able, how you expect to be able to impact the field with an advanced degree. Um, I would strongly encourage you to attend schools open houses. For example, Penn Engineering has a PhD open house coming up on November 5th. I will greatly, I will absolutely share that link um, in the chat when I'm finished with this presentation. But look at other opportunities to engage with current faculty and current students at your school of interest. And then I would also say inquire about fee waivers and any other funding opportunities. So I did include within the chat my email address. address. So if anyone on this call knows that they're going to apply to the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering and Applied Science, also known as Penn Engineering, please email me. Um, and I'll make sure that you receive a fee ringer code before you submit the application so that you don't have to pay our $90 application fee. Um, so that's all I have. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm happy to just be here and answer any questions you might have. And thank you again all for being here. Thank you, Christina. That was great. I think you answered a lot of questions, but I'll th I, I think you also created a lot more questions. Um, I want to let you all know that Christina has a profile on GradEd. You can find her. You can find the um, UPenn or Penn Engineering uh, Virtual Hub in the University Hubs, and you can chat with her there, send her a message, and if you feel the need to, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her. Um, and then continue the conversation. But I want to go back to Dr. Fan for a second here and come up with, you know, there's so many questions, like I said, we could spend another hour. But the one question that really jumps out at me, and I think a lot of students are asking the same question, is about the ethical uh, repercussions of data science and what's going on in the world right now uh, with privacy issues, with uh, data breaches, what are your thoughts on that? And as you are training future data scientists, how are you addressing these topics in terms of, you know, the ethical purview of data science and how they should be responsible for it? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is um, um, one of the biggest public concerns uh, for data science. And um, as you can imagine, when it comes to ethics, there's, um, there's a lot of, aspect that ethics actually concerned with um, and that first is the if you think about the data right there's already the ethic of the data itself uh, that uh, for example uh, the way in which the data are generated um, uh, whether it's you know it, it follow your know, moral convention whether it achieves those properties um, the way that they are recorded right for example can I you know just record my neighbor and then then share it with everybody right uh, and the way it's shared as well right? so so the first question is how do you address the ethic of data but beyond the data there's also the ethics that are concerned with the algorithm themselves right uh, and that is the word for example how do we use like uh, all these um, artificial intelligence, AI algorithms, uh, or uh, AML algorithms, uh, how do they interpret the data, right? So if you have a, a robot, for example, which is all based on AI, then the question of how do these robots see different, you know, the data itself. So the interpretation of the data by the algorithms and the artifacts that we develop, uh, also uh, we need to be, worry about you know whether the way they interpret uh, 
follow our you know ethical you know, address all these ethical concerns right and so uh that's too but there's also the practice itself so not just data or algorithm it's also about how you actually practice data science right uh and then uh the question there is how do you actually apply this algorithm to a particular setting uh in an ethical way right and so if you think about ethics in data science there's many many uh many issues that need to be addressed and and so how do we go about this? Uh, so there's been 30 in ethics, uh, but uh, now when we come to data science, there's uh, uh, several new challenges, right? And here, what I would see is that by tracing, you know, um, tracing the, uh, you know, make people aware of the ethical concerns that in itself are they first address part of the problem, right? And so if I was a student and if I were or I was a data scientist, I'm going to design the algorithm or use the data set, right? So I need to be, you know, mindful of where my data came from, whether they're actually, you know, uh, an ethical way. I need to care about the privacy of the user, you know, all this. And when I design the algorithms, how do I ensure that, you know, if I'm, I'm worried about ethics, then I will think about things like how to ensure fairness, how to make sure that uh, everybody has a fair and, and you know, equal representations in, in the way that my algorithm uh, see things. Or uh, when I design a self-autonomous car, uh, how do I actually make it make decisions in, in a fair way, right? And so these are things that I think is a really a uh, combination of both uh, uh, making students to understand, you know, what are the major ethical concerns and what are the problems that can arise. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, keep that in mind in actually designing in the use of data science. So the, the way that you use data, the way that you generate data, you share data, also the way that you design the algorithms, right? And for example, algorithm, maybe you design an algorithm to, to interpret, uh, um, uh, say, uh, uh, maybe evaluate a certain you know, group of people, right? And so sometimes in that you need to be aware of issues, like for example, racial issues in that, how do you make sure that they're fair across everybody's and so on, right? And so it's really, um, I think it's, uh, it is a process in itself, uh, but it needs, you know, both first and foremost, the understanding of these of the concerns. And then, you know, uh, that will be one of the focus whenever you go about using the data or, uh, um, or analyze data, develop new model, make prediction and so on. Uh, so, well, so thank you. That's that great. No, I really appreciate that. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I know, like I said, this is a topic that we could chat and discuss for hours yeah. at end. You know, yeah. and so, but but at the end of the day, what seems obvious is that data science is a field of study that's growing, that's evolving, that needs to be uh, pursued. And I think it's a great opportunity for students coming out of college right now to pursue data science as a program. And UPenn obviously is a wonderful school and Penn Engineering obviously has some great opportunities. Love that you're offering fee waivers, Christina, so that more students can even apply and explore. Um, but like I said, we can continue this discussion, but I do want to be mindful of everybody's time. I know Dr. Fan probably has classes to teach. Christina, you got work to get to. Um, so I just want to wrap up here and say thank you again to both Christina and Dr. Fan for being here. Thank you all for joining us on this session. If you missed it um, or if you caught us later after the session started, you can go back and watch the, the full session on demand on Gradded. Uh, but at the same time, like I said earlier, Christina is available on Gradded, so please do reach out to her, connect with her, send in your application, get a fee waiver, and we wish you the best of, best of luck. Um, as you know, we're going to be hosting a variety of workshops and sessions like these. Keep an eye on Gradded, um, check back in often, check the university hubs. Uh, and more importantly, connect with our staff across India uh, who can help guide you. So with that, I want to thank you again, Christina and Dr. Fan. Thank you so much. Um, you all have a great day, a great weekend, everybody. And uh, we'll see you at the next session. Talk to you thank soon. You, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye.